Shall we turn to Psalm 32 then? Um, I was hoping to be continuing on our kind of spiritual life theme, but it wasn't the kind of week to be able to devote uh, the time uh, to that that I, I hoped for. So uh, we have just a one-off uh, message here from Psalm 32 and a blessed reminder in it, I hope, for us all. So Psalm 32. I'd like to begin just by posing a question to you. What is it that you are striving for in life? Is there anything that you're striving for in life? Sometimes, you know, we, we strive and we seek so many things, uh, or people do, don't they? And, and often give their all for them. Um, you know, sometimes home and home comforts is just what people are striving for, to earn money, to, to pay for, and to uh, kind of make that their castle and the, their domain and to, uh, and all about their comforts and enjoyments. Maybe, maybe we might be striving for wealth or, or companionship or power or recognition, happiness, experiences. I mean, all these things have their place, don't they? Um, but we have to be careful how we kind of prioritize them, don't we? What is it that we truly need and should value most? Well, the answer comes in Psalm 32, a reflection of David on the blessing, the blessings of having forgiveness with God. Because once you have this, it's like everything else finds its proper place as you relate to God as your heavenly Father and Savior and Lord. The psalm has uh, something to say, certainly for the believers, but I think it also has something to say to those who aren't yet there. And hopefully we will be able to draw some of these thoughts out this morning. But first, there is the blessing of forgiveness in verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. What we have here is two Old Testament Beatitudes, don't we? We're familiar with the Beatitudes in the, in the Sermon on the, uh, on the Mount and uh, uh, Jesus' words there, but here are two Old Testament Beatitudes expressing the blessings of forgiveness. And it's noticeable here that... Uh, David doesn't begin with some impossible ideal. He doesn't say this, how blessed is the person who is entirely innocent? How blessed is the person who is without sin? No, he doesn't start off by saying that. That would be impossible, wouldn't it? Because there's none of us who could identify with that. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that in our own strength, We are weak, we're sinners, we've done wrong, all of us are in need of forgiveness. So there's some encouragement in these words, aren't they? Because they're not directed at some supposedly good person who has never done wrong, because they don't exist, do they? But it's expressed towards people like you and me, wrongdoers, lost souls, people who find themselves straying, who know what's right to do but find themselves doing the opposite, and what's wrong, who, who wander from the right path all too often. That's you and that's me. And he says, there's a blessing here for those like you, like me, going astray, doing wrong, who find forgiveness. He reflects on three, three words here. There's three sim- sinful ways used in, described in three words, um, expressing something of the ways in which we do wrong. You can pick them up there. There is the word transgression, and there is sin in verse 1, and then there's the word iniquity in verse 2. Well, what is a transgression? Uh, a transgression at, at root is is the crossing over of a line. It's like there's a demarcation. Do not walk on the grass. 
Of course, as soon as we see that, we kind of want to touch it. Do not touch the wet paint. Oh, is it still wet? We touch it. You know, well, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind, strength and soul. And, 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 and we transgress that. Thou, thou shalt not lie. We transgress that. Thou shalt not steal. We, we take. We transgress that commandment. So um, sin, as 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is lawlessness. There, there is a law, but we transgress and break and, and spill over and, and contradict it. And therefore, it is, a, it is an act of disobedience, isn't it? And of rebellion against God's law and therefore God's will. Sin means at root to, to miss the mark, to fall short, to not live up to a standard that God expects. And iniquity here in the Hebrew means something made crooked. If you look this up in Strong's, it says to crook. Now that's interesting, we don't, we don't use that word anymore. But to crook, to crook means to make something crooked and hence um, to, 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 to corrupt something out of shape, to bend it out of shape. An iniquity is something made crooked, corrupted. It is a, a wickedness. David, no doubt, recalls certain things in his own life. We, we know that Psalm 51 certainly falls out of that time when he sins with Bathsheba and so on. Maybe Psalm 32 also reflects on some, some moments of, of failure and fault and guilt and troubles that uh, David himself went through. And he recalls these things in his own life, and perhaps we do too. You know, there's times when we, we need to take stock, isn't there, and, and, and think about our spiritual life. Have we transgressed? Are we sinning? Are we uh, committing iniquity before the Lord? And, of course, sometimes when we think of sin, it is things that we do, isn't it? Well, I've not done that. Thou shalt not murder. Well, I've not done that. And we think, well, I stand clear on that one. But then we remember Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount that says, you've heard it's been said, and thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with someone without fault has committed murder in his, in his heart. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who has looked and lusted has committed adultery in the heart, that actually the law goes so much deeper, doesn't it, in terms of what we may have done, a sin of commission. But there is also sins of omission, sins of things which we should have done, which we've not done. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength and soul. Well, have we done that? Well, of course not. Then, then it's a sin of omission, isn't it? There are things that we do wrong. There's things that are wrong that we have not done effectively. You remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus that he might obtain eternal life. What should I do that I might obtain eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the law, you know the commandments, what are they? And uh, he, 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 he lists a few and, you know, these things I've kept from my youth. I wonder if you have, says Jesus. Hey, let's test you on the first one. Go and sell all that you have and give your goods to the poor. And then come follow me. And he went away brokenhearted, didn't he? Because he had all that wealth and he was being tested on whether he really did love the Lord, his God, with all his heart and mind and strength and soul. And so we can be the same, can't we? Things that we do wrong, things that we haven't done, that we're not willing to do because our hearts, our love, our passions are in other places. And so, though these words here are singular, blessed is he whose transgression, whose sin, whose iniquity, though these are expressed in singular terms, yet we know, aren't we, don't we, that they re relate to many. Really, it should say transgressions and sins and iniquities. But I think he's just speaking about the principle of these things, isn't he? 
well, in the light of this, the blessed soul, David exalts, the blessed soul is the one who, despite his rebellion and transgression, finds nevertheless that he is forgiven. The blessed soul is the one who, despite his sin, despite falling short of the standard that God has set for us, for us in life, has assurance that his sin is covered and atoned for. The blessed soul is the one who, though he has acted corruptly, yet is confident that he will not be held to account, to whom the Lord does not impute, account, reckon iniquity. And therefore, before God has become someone in whose spirit there is no guile or deceit. The end of verse 2 there. The wonderful thing about the opening of this psalm is that these blessings are not for the perfect. They're for the imperfect, aren't they? But it is to make us perfect. It is that we might be forgiven, that we might stand before the Lord. In those verses that we read there from Romans chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5, it has and expresses this wonderful truth. It says this, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now he's talking there in this section about the imputation as a result of faith. But here, just pick up on this. God justifies not good people, not perfect people, but ungodly people. God is in the, begin, in, in the business of saving the ungodly, of justifying the ungodly, of saving unrighteous people, of, of curing wicked people, people who sin, people like you and me. And so when you are forgiven, though your sins are scarlet, as the scripture promises, they shall be white as wool. Praise the Lord. Well, this word forgiven here, means to bear away, to remove like a burden lifted. And it's like when we become conscious of our sin, it's like a, a burden weighing down upon our shoulders. Some of you might recall uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress as he, as he learns about his city, city of destruction. He heads out for the celestial city, doesn't he? But as he goes, there's a great burden on his back, which as he falls into the slough of despond, is, it, you know, might, might sink him into the, the, the mire unless the evangelist was there to pull him out and point him in the right direction. Eventually, he finds his way to the cross, doesn't he? And as he looks to the cross and sees the Lord Jesus there, as it were, in faith on the cross, that burden falls off his back, if you remember, falls into a grave and is seen no more. And he's set free, isn't he? What a wonderful picture Bunyan paints there. Well, where does he get that kind of language from? I think it's right from, from right here. It's, it's about this burden bearing, this sin bearing. We, we'll get a sense of it in verses three and four in, in a moment. But David kind of reflects on this weight of his sin like a burden which the Lord himself only can bear away. What was it that, uh, that John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that takes away, look it up again, it is, it is to bear away, as it were, to take away, to bear a load, to be the scapegoat. Do you remember in the Old Testament they had... They had those two goats that were brought, and one was, uh, uh, their sins were confessed over both of them, wasn't it? And one was, was slain as an offering, and the other was a scapegoat, as it were. And they would take it outside the city, and they would chase it off into the wilderness to, to picture the bearing away of their sin. And, and, and the scapegoat, I think that word was, had to be invented so that we might understand, and, and it's become understandable now for us, isn't it? That, here is the burdens being taken away. It all points to what Jesus would do for us. And this is the truth, isn't it, of imputation. Blessed, how blessed is the man 
to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. What does this impute mean? It means to reckon. So, so here's you and me, and we, we do what we do. We live our lives. We, 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 we sin and so on. And, and, and all of that is seen by the Lord. And that is reckoned to our account. At the end of the, the world, as it were, the books would be opened. And, and everyone would be judged according to their deeds, it says. And, and in, the, in the deeds of Murray Gifkins, there would be this. And in the deeds of, put your name in there, there would be that record, as it were, uh, imputed to you of what you have done. It's going to be held to your account. But David speaks here of a blessedness of those to whom the Lord does not impute, that, that those things are no longer reckoned to us, but reckoned elsewhere. And of course, we know the gospel truth is Christ. Uh, it, you know, how does this come? Well, our sins are reckoned to Christ, aren't they? And his righteousness is reckoned to us. And there's this wonderful spiritual swap, as it were, as Christ substitutes his perfect life and bears the penalty for our sin that we might be freed and delivered from the reckoning of our sins, as it were, and receive the righteousness of God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. So what is it that makes David utter this beatitude? It's when he reflects on the blessing of having forgiveness with God. Because all other things we have in life are, are like a mirage without this. Whatever we have, if we, if we haven't got forgiveness, then all manner of things are going to be taken from us. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Well, why would someone lose their soul? Because they're not forgiven. And sins are still reckoned to their account. And so on the last day, there's nothing to say except guilty. And for the guilty, the punishment, the penalty that God warns of. Well, why did Christ come? It was to deliver us from the penalty of our sins. It was to deliver us from that fearful day of judgment. It was to deliver us that we might be set free from our sins. And so if we gain the whole world but lose our soul, it profits nothing. Everything that we have will be taken away and given to him who has, Jesus says. And so therefore blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. For with forgiveness, a person has every other gift that comes with it. It's like a fountain spring, isn't it? In which every other blessing flows. As I thought it, uh, you know, whose sin is covered. H how can something be unseen, as it were, to the eyes of the all seeing God? God sees and knows everything. And yet, there is the promise here that our sin will be covered, as it were, covered from God's sight, covered. Uh, as in atoned for, that it might no longer be ours. And I think he's reminded us here of that wonderful promise that God chooses to remember our sins no more. What a precious thing to know that. Or do you know that your sins are covered? Do you know whether you have forgiveness do you know whether you have assurance in that last day when we'll be raised up once more before the judge of all the earth who shall do right it's got to be the most important thing to be certain of in life we may say that we know that christ's blood is sufficient to pardon all sin we've grown up in church we've heard it said time and again we know there's a savior from sin it's the lord jesus christ but that knowledge doesn't give us assurance until, as it were, we've received it for ourselves. We've taken it to heart. It's not, it's not true until, until it's become particularly ours, is it? 
It's one thing to know there's sweet water at a spring on a certain hill, but it's another thing to have been there and drank from it and been personally refreshed by it. And that's what we're invited to do through the gospel. Come, come to me and find mercy. Well, how do we find this forgiveness? How do we obtain this blessing? What does this journey to finding it look like? Well, we have the way to finding it in verses uh, 3 and 4 and 5. So David, is, he's, he's exalted, he's rejoiced in the blessedness of forgiveness, but now it's like he, he looks back to a time before he knew it personally or, or with certainty. Perhaps he stepped away from the things of the Lord and, and uh, was uh, in his journey going through a kind of a wilderness time. And it's one that we might identify with too, that there can be, for a variety of reasons, all kind of dry times that occur in the Christian life. And some of them can be because there's sins that remain unconfessed that we need to bring to the light and bring to the Lord. And those two key thoughts that seem to shape this phrase here, verses 3 to 5, is when I kept silent, and then at verse 5, I acknowledged my sin. This is what these, the, the, these verses hang upon. When I kept silent, we see here, when he kept silent, his bones growing old, his groaning all day long, day and night, a heaviness upon him, a vitality, a, a life within him that seemed to be to be withered and turned into the drought of summer. And it seems to me that he's under conviction of sin. This is what conviction of sin often feels like, isn't it? A guilty conscience, a, a, an inner knowledge that something is not right, a, a dryness, a, a, a something that is, that is wrong, our bones feeling old, our groaning, a uh, 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 heaviness, uh, a lifelessness. Well, that isn't always the case that there's sin, but this can be the case that, that sin causes this. And it's a very human response, isn't it, that we, we want to keep silent about it. When I kept silent, I don't want to, con- I don't want to make, make this known. I don't want to disclose this. This would bring shame to me. I'd rather these things were hidden and swept under the carpet and that's kind of what we spiritually do, thinking that, that somehow or other they'll be dealt with there. But the knowledge of our wrongs and our guilt before him, they weigh down upon us like a burden day and night. And David speaks of aches and groanings and heaviness and feeling dry and, and an inward drought. And this is something we may also feel at times. And that sense of something being wrong and And to those who feel that burden, do you feel that burden? Well, here are the words of Jesus. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, who are burdened, and I will give you rest. There is a remedy, isn't there? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we must come to. And so what does he point us to what we must do? The turning point here. It's verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you. I just had to get it off my chest. I just had to confess. I had to face up to it. I, I, I could no longer hide it. My iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord. I've got to make a, a clean break here. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What is it that, that David here is facing up to? He, he, he's facing up to the truth. He's facing up to the truth of of who we are, what we've done or neglected to do. The truth of who God is and what our state is before him. And this is what we have to do, to face up to that same truth, to face up to uh, God's accounting of our life, to face up to the fact that we will give account, to face up to the consequences of our actions. And And when we name our sin, our iniquity, our transgression, when we acknowledge it and disclose it and confess it and forsake it, then and only then we find forgiveness. Here at the end of verse 5, having 
brought all these things, having unburdened them to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What, what is it that's going on here? This is, this is repentance, isn't it? This is, this is repentance and faith here. He's, he's responding to the word of God. He's responding to the spirit of God. He's responding to the, to the truth of God as it is, it is weighing down on his conscience. And, and, the, and through faith and then repentance, turning, confessing, telling the Lord, this is, this is, this is how he comes to find forgiveness of sin. As it were, we're brought low, aren't we? That we might be lifted up. We're broken that we might be healed. And note, there's, there, there's some kind of inner resolve here that has to be stirred in him. I said, I will. You know, I will confess. Here he is speaking to himself. And sometimes we have to do that. Get right with the Lord. Tell him those things that are wrong. Come to him honestly. Come just as you are. And come and find forgiveness. Well, as we know, this, is, this, this speaks to two, two kinds of people, doesn't it? Those who have never found forgiveness yet, there is the invitation. But those of us also who struggle and maybe do things wrong, and that, here's the reminder. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness that, that we need to come back to the Lord again, time and again. And that we might find in him forgiveness. Do you know what it's like to carry a burden around? To, to know that you're not right with God? Well, the solution, reminds the psalmist, is confession, honesty before God, transparency and openness. God sees everything and knows everything. All he's waiting for is us to reckon that he does see and know everything and to be honest before him. And if we are, there's the promise in verse 5. You forgave not just my sin, but you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You forgave the ruinous, crooked perverseness of it. Why is it so? Because God is a holy God and it is this problem between us and God of sin that has to be dealt with. But this is what David recalls and delights in, that sin, iniquity, is no longer going to be held to his account. And out of that flows some security. So there's a security of having forgiveness, verses 6 and 7. As David reflects on the forgiveness he's found and testifies of it, so we're encouraged to come to the Lord and to find that same treasure. And, uh, you know, just, just think about how many people put this off. Do you know, too many people think, well, I'm enjoying my life right now. I'm doing this and doing that. You know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll think about religion. I'll think about the things of God later on in life. And, and they procrastinate and they leave it too late. And they leave it too late because, because in life, we, it's like, the ruts in the road. I remember years ago, years and years ago, we, we, and I say this, we, and I was a youngster, and I was, I was traveling with my mum and dad and family down to Spain. And it was a kind of caravan holiday. They were driving, they got the caravan behind. And we were, we were on a road, and this road must have been frequented by plenty of trucks before it, because the road was no longer kind of flat or even with a camber. It was like this, you know, there was two ruts there. And once you were in that rut, you were kind of stuck in the rut. And it was really hard to kind of, you know, kind of move into a different bit of the, of the road. And, and that can be like it in life. After 60 or 70 years of, of living the same way without God, of, of dulling down the conscience, of thinking nothing about the Lord or the things of the Lord and so on, people end up in a rut. Do you think they're going to turn to the Lord in their 60s and 70s, having, having got stuck in that way for so long? Well, it doesn't happen, does it? You know, and that's why today is the day of salvation. Today is the day the Lord might be found. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time, in a day when you may be found. Seek him early. 
Be satisfied with his mercy early. We need him now because we need him for life. We don't know what will tomorrow will happen to us tomorrow, do we? You know, there was a day, wasn't there, when the ark was sealed and the cries of those outside saying, let us in, open up. We believe you now. I can see rain. I've never seen it before, but I can believe it's going to happen. Let us in. It was too late. They all perished, didn't they? And the day will also come when here he speaks of a flood of great waters, hence the ark as it were. But the, but the flood of great waters ultimately is God's judgment on the last day. And if we put it off and put it off, there, there's a chance that we will never come to the Lord. But we need to come to the Lord right now. We need to avail ourselves of God's mercy right now. For this cause, everyone who's godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. And surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You see, forgiveness is the fount from which all other blessings flow. If you're right with God, even if, even if your life is taken in a moment, in a car crash, in an earthquake, in, in a plane falling out of the sky, or in whatever kind of thing, you're secure in the Lord, aren't you? You know where you're going. You have forgiveness in him. And you can trust that all these things work together for good. And, and this is what is so important, isn't it? To know we're secure in him. He is our hiding place. He will preserve us from trouble and surround us with songs of deliverance. There we have uh, there we have the promises of God, don't we? And of the security that we have in him. Well, how can we be sure of this? Well, because when we have forgiveness with God through Christ, we are no longer in sin. We are in him, aren't we? We're in Christ. Christ is our hiding place. He is our rock. He is our security. We are hidden in the cleft of the rock. We're joined to him by his wounded side that we might be raised to share in his resurrection. And, and here's the promise. We shall be preserved. We shall endure. We shall enjoy the presence of God. The songs of deliverance will be ours. The heavenly anthem of the saints in Zion. This is our confidence that once forgiven, we are in a, in a secure position in Christ. And this is what Ephesians chapter 1 is about, isn't it? Or chapters 1 to 3. How valuable a possession it is to be in that position. You're raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's because you are in that position in him. You have all these spiritual possessions and security is perhaps the strongest of them. Well, there are also some other promises that go along with forgiveness in verses 8 and 9. And this seems to be like the response of God. The I speaking, the I will instruct you, I will guide you, seems to be the Lord speaking now to David, the psalmist, to, to the reader of the psalm, to the one who meditates upon it and takes it to heart. And... His promise is a promise of guidance here. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Don't be like the horse or like the mule which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. You know, I suppose without the Lord, our life, our journey through life is just a life of the, the school of hard knocks, as it, as it were. You know, that we have to, we try this and do that, and we, we kind of learn by experience and the hard shocks of life. Well, that's a bit like being a horse or a mule, a, a horse that needs restraint or a mule that needs kind of it to be, to be whipped, uh, to, to, to move, to learn, to be controlled with bit and bridle, yanked this way, brought up sharp, whipped along or directed. And he's speaking about the kind of stubbornness of sin in, a, in the life of those ruled by self-will. 
But when we find forgiveness, when we, uh, when we give ourselves over to the Lord, then he promises to instruct us, to teach us, and to guide us. It's like we're, we're, we're giving ourselves over to a new captain, a new pilot who's steering the ship. You know, formerly, formerly our life was, was guided by me, myself, and I, self-will on the throne, another bunion, will be will on the throne in the Holy War, that book. But when we submit to the Lord, when we find forgiveness in him, when we, when we are, are reconciled to him and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, well, it's like there's a new pilot who guides us to the safe haven that he desires in life. And there's a reminder here, isn't there, that there's no such thing as safe sin. We are to be guided, reminded by God's word and by his spirit. And that though there may be a need even for chastening, yet ultimately he works all things together for good. Do you want to know that you will reach heaven, that you will obtain the inheritance? Well, track all of those things back and it begins with coming to the Lord, seeking forgiveness, doesn't it? Come and realize, realizing and believing and confessing your sin to him and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. That's where the journey starts, as it were, and God promises thereafter to keep us, to sanctify us, to change us, to uh, make us like himself, to adopt us into his family that we might have every blessing in heavenly places in Christ with him. Well, along the way, we may need some chastening. We may need God's hand to guide us, but we can trust him that he will work all things together for good. There is a promise that goes along with forgiveness, God's guidance to bring us to his safe haven. Well, finally here, there is ultimate consequences for forgiveness in verses 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord, rejoice ye righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. It seems to me that in this psalm, David reflects finally on the two great outcomes of life. It's a little bit like Psalm 1. Remember in Psalm 1, there's two ways you, could, you can go, isn't there? There's the way of the ungodly, which will perish. The way of the righteous, that will bear fruit and leaf and, and, and have the blessing of God. And he seems to, pay, to, to, to point out two journeys, two pathways here. We all begin on the roadway bound for destruction. The road with many sorrows in it. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. That's the path we all start out on. But it's the path that those who do not come to the Lord for forgiveness find themselves kind of hardened into. They settle into that, into that rut and continue on in their sin. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. And their end is going to be sad. But there's this possibility of unless or until we hear the call to enter the narrow gate, which leads to life and obey that call. When we humbly do so, we receive the many blessings of God. For with this gift comes every other one. With it, we're set bound on a new destination. We're surrounded by the grace and mercies of God to keep us. And perhaps most, perhaps most importantly, with forgiveness, with being right with God, we can claim those promises for the righteous. Here, as, as two people kind of find their paths in life, the wicked, in opposition to them, as it were, contrasted with them, verse 11, is the righteous. You righteous, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. You know, when you read of the righteous in the Proverbs or in the Psalms, it seems so hard, isn't it, to, to kind of claim those as being ours. Well, who am I? And, and when, when, we, when we look inward. 
But when we look to Christ and realize in him we have forgiveness, we are made righteous, aren't we? We are justified in his sight. And we have been turned from the wicked to, to being God's holy people, to be his saints, to be upright in heart here. And so if we truly know we have forgiveness with God, which is why Christ gave his life on the cross to be the propitiation for our sin, then we have reason to be happy, reason to be glad, reason to rejoice and shout for joy as he ends here. Why? Because, because God has given us a new heart. He has turned our heart from being downward, as it were, to upright here. Rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Is that uh, because of something intrinsic in me? No, far from it. It's because of something intrinsic in Christ. And, and because I'm blessed by the fact that my sins and iniquities are no longer imputed to me, but are imputed to him. And his righteousness is imputed back to me. And now I can stand before the Lord as one of his sons. He's adopted as one of his saints, upright in heart, a, a privilege to count on all the promises of God, knowing that I will be with him one day forever, knowing that I'll be his inheritance and he will be my inheritance. Wow, when you think about that, there is reason, isn't there, to shout for joy, to rejoice in the Lord because of forgiveness of sins. Well, are you right with the Lord? There's a message there and a thought there for those of you not yet right with the Lord. But also for those of us who have walked with the Lord and find ourselves sometimes going through dry and hard and tough times. Is there something we need to get right with the Lord over? Is there something we need to openly confess to him that might be forgiven, that we might be restored with the joy of our salvation? Let's close in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Lord, may we go away this morning and reflect continually upon it. May we take to heart this message. May we know for certain this morning what it means to be right with you. We pray, Father, for one another. If there's any here today that needs to get right with you as a first step, Lord, we pray that you would touch their hearts and draw them to you and impress upon their conscience the need for that and that there is a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has arms open and is willing to receive all who come to God through him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And loving Father, just as we're reminded in, in the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, we need your mercies renewed every day in our lives. So forgive us, Lord, and transform us, Father, and renew within us a right spirit, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, our Saviour. Amen.